Okay, welcome to Seeing to Lead, all you eager listeners. And this is episode two in a series about SEL put on by Mike James. Now, Mike is my guest, and Mike's not just a passionate coach, mentor, and leader dedicated to fostering positive change through the principles of Mira, which are mindset, intention, and right action. But he's also a person that has had an impact in my life and the life of the rest of Team Jones. We've worked with him quite a bit, and he is continuing to amplify his impact. He's the founder of Simple Healthy Life, and he's committed to guiding individuals and communities towards personal and collective growth. That's why I think he's going to be such a valuable guest throughout the course of this series. And we're talking about, I don't want to use the wrong word, but it's almost a framework where it's build more powerful community. And there are some very specific words that go under that, teach, train, develop, and inspire that are kind of guiding us through this series. So this is episode two. I encourage you to go back and listen to episode one because that was part of build and teach. That was the framework setting the the groundwork so that you can understand more of the strategies and the tactics that you're going to hear in this episode and as we move forward. And really deep down in your core, we believe that we have to have all the answers or we believe that we are this person or we believe that this role that we're playing as teacher or educator or parent or mom or dad or sister or brother, right? It's all our belief system. And if you're willing to sit down and say, okay, that's a belief system that I learn through knowledge gained, through experiences had, but can I challenge them? Can I sit down and say, why do I think that I should be this way? Dr. Chris Jones here and welcome to Seeing to Lead, a show designed to help leaders increase their ability to effectively support, engage, and empower their staff through intentional practices so that they create an environment where everyone reaches their greatest level of success. On Seeing to Lead, communication rules the day as we hear voices from both teachers and leaders in an effort to examine perspectives, highlight misunderstandings, and provide steps to ultimately bridge the gap between what teachers need and provide through thought dialogue. This show is about amplifying voices, creating understanding, and providing information to help everyone continually improve. I want to personally thank you for taking the time. Now, let's get to getting better. So, Mike, welcome to episode two. Thank you. I appreciate you having me back. I uh, loved episode one. I thought that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed some of the questions you asked to really help me think a little more, a little deeper about some of the topics that we discussed. And uh, I'm looking forward to that again today. I don't think that's going to be a problem. Whenever you and I get together, we tend to have good conversations. Sometimes we go a little awry, but it it all ties up in the end. So (laughs) it's good stuff. So, hey, look, you know, we, we ended the last one when we were talking about building. You talked about the ancients and the architecture and all through that. But we ended with me asking a question about actions reflecting our core values. And if that's a way that we're maybe trying to deal with where we are and our ability to be aware of where we are and how we move forward from that, which leads me to the idea or your idea of more. Now that, and we joked about this at the end of the last episode, more is such an interesting sounding word because you don't have a beginning, you don't have an end, it's just more, right? And you mentioned that more is built really off the Kaizen principle, the 1% principle. So how about I stop talking? You start imparting your knowledge and wisdom to everybody so they benefit. And uh, you go ahead and run with that and let us know what you mean by that and where that came from. Awesome. Thank you. You know, I think I'll start with your question, right? Is, and we got this into this at the end. We all have an ethos and we all have these core values that we're, that we aspire or that we believe are ourselves. But sometimes our actions don't line up with that. Sometimes our words don't, right? Realistically, actually, and that's a word I'm going to use a box today. Actually, they don't. (laughs) You know, I can tell you that I, that I love and and cherish and want to be the best person to my wife at all times, a hundred percent. And sometimes actually I've been, right? I'm not perfect. You know, that's just one example. So what I figured out was let's try to train around the idea 
of getting 1% better, right? 1% better every day. And we've all heard that. Many of us kind of don't know where it comes from. And the credit is given. I won't say that they created it, but the credit is given to like a Japanese business principle called Kaizen. And their goal was to get 1% better every day. Now, if I'm being honest with ourselves, we're probably talking about a corporate executive trying to figure out how to make 1% more money every day, right? Through seven layers of management and 200 and 2,000 employees. What they stumbled into is something that I, I really believe is impactful for all of us. And that's the word actual, right? So when we tie it to the first question you asked, of course, our ethos and our values stand true, but do our behavior and our words actually line up with that? And if they don't, that's okay. Can we get 1% better at that every day? And they are saying, hey, let's go down and talk to the actual people. And I love the way that they put that. That's what let me know it was more of a big corporation. Let's talk to the <laughs> actual people, right? Yeah. Who's doing this process? Let's look at our actual process and refine it a little bit each day, right? Don't hope for this massive outcome. Just refine one thing each day. And, you know, it goes back to the principles of learning something new every day or teaching yourself something new every day. Um, and for educators, you know, it's a million examples of ways where we can improve ourselves every day. But as people, what do we do? How can we train ourselves to live by the Kaizen principle? How can we train ourselves to get 1% better every day. And for me, what I I think we should start with is this concept, right? This concept of mindset, intention, right action, okay? So first things first, throw it out. If you don't have the intention to get 1% better every day or you forgot that you were intending on getting 1% better every day, it's gonna be really hard. (laughs) So if we get our intention, right? If we start with our minds, mindset, around improvement is going to be an easy one. That's the growth mindset, right? There's only a few of them that we've kind of identified through our learning and education system. And then we go, okay, growth mindset, intention, 1% better every day. I think our listeners can understand and grasp that, but then let's train on it. So what do we do? Well, we have to look at the actual people inside us, (laughs) right? Look at the actual process. What does our day really look like? And what is actually happening, right? When you shut the door in the in the morning and you're the only one in the bathroom, do you actually brush your teeth? <laughs> I'm just using this as an example, right? Nobody knows. Maybe if you get to work and you don't have good breath. <laughs> but like, what's actually happening, right? And I think this is where we can start to train ourselves to sit. And this is where it gets a little bit more into the understanding of social emotional learning and where it comes from we can sit first and what is that like is it a two minute sit is it a 10 minute sit are we sitting and trying to plan our day or are we journaling or are we you know are we writing down our goals or did we skip the extra dessert right at lunch right because it's there for you what is the thing that we want to do that day to get one percent better that's, you know, it's funny some of the things you mentioned and, and how you mentioned we we're going to, we we're going to get into some tactics. And before, before we hit record, we were having a funny conversation about Dunkin' Donuts, not to offend anybody from Starbucks or any of my Dunks people in Massachusetts, but that 1% better, sometimes people say it and they still stretch too far. You know, I was just reading an interesting book about goals and it talked about how oftentimes we set goals and we get frustrated. So we stop tons of respect for those who start incredible admiration for those who continue because we fail ourselves. If we set a goal and I think the example they used was running a marathon. So it really kind of hurt my feelings because everybody knows I only run if there's barbecue involved, but if you run a marathon, the first day, if you're, if you say, my goal is to run a marathon, the first day you lace up your shoes, you go out and run. Well, the next day you're really sore and tired. So if you got that ton of willpower left, maybe you run the next day. But pretty soon when you're struggling to finish a mile, you know, you're not going to run a marathon and it kind of falls off and you don't do it. They suggest cutting it in half, which I struggle with 
thinking of that. But that 1% piece, I think of to-do lists. People talk about your big three things. What are you going to do for your big three things in the day? But who only has big three big things to do, so they do seven? Well, then you fall short of getting all seven of those things done, and you kind of get that, ne- that negative self-talk again, and you fall short, and you disappoint yourself, and you fail yourself because you set your goal too high. And I think in schools, a lot of times administrators expect too big of a change too soon from their teachers, who then in turn expect too big of a change too soon from their students. So I guess how do we, here's the question after me blabbing for a while, how do we foster that sense of just a little better every day is going to get you where you need to be because it's consistent rather than the sputter, fast start, stop and quit aspect of the other way? Great question. That's a great question. You know, I think we'll go back to the way that the Japanese businessman did it. They wrote it down. And now it's a silly exercise and it's not difficult, but it isn't. Let me back up. It's a simple exercise that is not difficult, but it's very hard. It's very hard to acknowledge first and foremost, what the actual challenges are that you're up against, right? It internally, okay, why didn't that happen? Why can't I run a marathon, right? It's easy to say, well, I need to lose weight. Okay, cool. That's an easy one, right? Okay, so a little deeper. Well, if I really want to run a marathon, then I should probably change my diet. Well, why can't I change my diet? Well, because I like food. Okay, cool. A little deeper, right? What is it about the reward system around food that is more important to you than running a marathon? I don't know, right? Deeper, 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 deeper. And then you can back into, okay, cool. So maybe I don't need to worry about running the full marathon. I need to worry about not eating late at night so that I can get up the next morning and feel my best, right? Maybe that's completely off base and it's an example that, that isn't even relatable, but you can see how you can use this process of understanding and training yourself to look deeper and look at the actual process to find a way to get to the outcome you're looking for. Does that make sense? No, it makes a lot of sense. I was just going to ask you, so it's about, and I even have an example, but it's about finding the right or the actual lever to enact change. Right. To steal your term. Well said. Well said. And I think about, just to go back to the Dunkin' Donuts thing, because, and just to spoiler for the audience, Mike and I were talking about Dunkin' Donuts and how we found out we both have a, a strong liking, minds of love, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Mike, for <laughs> stock cold brew coffee that you buy in the grocery store. Well, Dunkin' Donuts, a large coffee that I buy typically costs me almost five bucks. One bottle of stock cold brew that lasts me for two days costs me five bucks. So it's the little changes. And I've now found that I don't even care for the the taste of Dunkin' Donuts. I share that because I have this thing with my boys that I call truck talks. We go for rides and we say, hey, let's go get a coffee. Neither one of my kids drink coffee, (laughs) but we go to the furthest dunks we can find and take the furthest way back home because we have a talk why we go. We talk about something. We spend that time alone together in a truck where you don't have any other option except to talk. And it's very fruitful. It's very beneficial. And it works on these different types of things we're talking about as far as training, positive self-image, and things like that. But I noticed that it used to be, or it started my desire to have this talk started around the idea of coffee. It had nothing to do with coffee. It had to do with me wanting to hang out with my kid. But until I dug down into that and went without the coffee, I found that was the real reason that I enjoyed those so much. That's funny. It actually maybe even took removing the coffee to figure it out, which is interesting. So, <laughs> and that's what it is, right? It's, it's playing around. Now without, and I'm not going to, and people listening to this are going to appreciate this. I'm not going to break open the whole argument about grades. 
and grading systems in schools. We're not going to get into that on this show, but <laughs> it's it takes playing around because for us in schools to tell students this is one thing. For us to be true to our actual actions is something totally different that we fall short on because we're not playing around to find out what it really is about, what understanding really is about, what the true impact of social emotional learning breaks in schools are really about proven by science. So how do we do that? How do we, and this is, this is um, just off the cuff and it, it's probably inaccurate. It might even upset some people, but how do we stop taking ourselves so darn seriously that we don't play around a little bit to figure out what'll work better? So this goes back to really this understanding of yourself, right? And where does it come from, right? The, the challenge that most of us have as adults with fully framed personalities and mostly framed value systems and belief systems. And I, I listened to somebody recently, and I think I can get away with this on the podcast today, but they just kept calling BS. And BS was your belief system. And I was like, wow. I need to incorporate that into my talking because <laughs> that is right. That is BS, right? And, and really deep down in your core, we believe that we have to have all the answers or we believe that we are this person or we believe that this role that we're playing as teacher or educator or parent or mom or dad or sister or brother, right? It's all our belief system. And if you're willing to sit down and say, Okay, that's a belief system that I learn through knowledge gained, through experiences had. But can I challenge them? Can I sit down and say, why do I think that I should be this way? Or why do I think that X should be the president of the United States? Uh, you know, that's just a good one for people that probably rile them up, right? Thank, but, thanks for <laughs> opening that one up. Yeah, I, I, won't, I won't go any deeper. I won't go any deeper. But like, really? Are you willing to, are you willing to sit down with the actual people, you, and call BS? And if you are, then we can talk about how to do that, right? You can, we can literally say things like that, that are counterproductive. And, and we'll get into that when we talk about developing, right? Because one of the major and most interesting parts of this whole game is our current neuroscience tells us it's not about the doing, right? It's about the allowing. It's about the sitting. And say, I'm okay. Maybe I ask myself a question before I start and I'm okay with whatever the answer is. I'm okay with whatever comes into my head from whoever or wherever or whatever it comes from. I'm not going to pretend like I'm going to tell you where that comes from because we don't know. But neuroscience tells us that when you do that, you can actually rewire and change physically your brain which will actually rewire and change physically your belief system, which will allow you to actually change and actually get 1% better. So it's not, it's, a, it's an intangible thing that we have made very tangible, but you have to do the work, right? And what does the work look like? This is where we get into the training aspect. The, the work is not sitting on a pillow. I went, you know, a little funny thing. I went to my first sit this night. And so I went to the Cambridge Institute of Mindfulness. I think the last word is mindfulness. Either way, I went to see somebody um, I really respect talk. And there was a 45-minute sit before. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, uh, no, I've never been to a sit before. I imagine it's like a guided meditation. Well, I walked into the room and it was a sit. It was sitting on a pillow for 45 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to sit. And that, and. It's okay. It was a new experience. It was an opportunity for me to learn and, and get better. But it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be that at all. We have so many different tools at our, at our you know, disposal. For educators, there's tools out there that are people just doing meditations for educators, right? This amazing group out there. John Kabat-Zinn was an educator. He, he started to build this into the system that and teach people what this looks like, right? So from a tactical perspective, it can be as simple as connecting to your breath, right? And we know this to be true, right? This is where I have to make sure that we don't lose people, right? Because as soon as I say that, 
They talk about, you know, the yoga and the yogis and the Buddhists and the, and the taboo and all the things, right? But what I'm talking about is our physical science. The way the body physically takes in and lets go of air, right? Where you connect to that as your anchor. And I say this all the time. Connecting or bringing awareness to sensation quiets the mind, right? And you can try that right now. If you wanted to, you can close your eyes and breathe in through your nose and feel the way that the air comes in through the nose and notice that just for that split second, it was the only thing on your mind, right? And once we do that, and once we do that consistently for a little period of time, we allow the minds to rest. We shut down that default mode network like we talked about in the last podcast. And we start to create a little bit of space between our BS and who we really are. And once we start that process, if we can get better at that 1% every day, think about the growth you'd see in one year. Think about the growth you'd see in your, in your teachers, in your students, in yourself, in your family, in your relationships, in your community. If we could just do that 1% better every day. That's, well, you really said it there. I said a lot of stuff. Yeah, you said a ton of stuff. As you were saying that, I was thinking about a bunch of different things. Supporting your teachers and students seems to be a struggle. They just don't seem to be engaged. You wish they would take more responsibility for their learning and culture of the building, but they just don't seem to be empowered enough to do it. So my question is, have you checked out the book Seeing to Lead yet? It's all about creating a true educational experience where learning, growth, Leadership and community take center stage. Full of strategies and resources, Seeing to Lead is about attaining that goal by employing a model that supports, engages, and empowers all individuals to become leaders themselves. Pick up a copy today at seeingtolead.com. That's S-E-E-I-N-G-T-O-L-E-A-D.com. Remember, You don't become a leader and then decide you need to support and recognize others more than yourself. It is the moment you realize it's about supporting and recognizing others that you become a leader. Seeingtolead.com What really resonated with me was bringing awareness to sensation quiets the mind. And when you were talking about, you were talking about breath, but I'm going to get to that. You know, we're so distracted today in society. We talk about it with students a lot, but that's because students are easy to talk about, right? They're younger. (laughs) I'll love to talk about students and not talk about themselves, about the phones, about TVs, all that blue light and how distracting everything is because these companies, they pay people a lot of money, psychologists, to gear these things to make sure you're addicted to them, that they get your attention. And everything's competing for our attention and we're so distracted. I can't help but think one of the barriers to breathing and to becoming connected to your breath is a level of uncomfortableness with who we actually are as individuals. And I find that people who are more distracted and spend more and more time lost in a world of electronics are uncomfortable with confronting who they may really be. Not to say it's a bad thing that they're a bad person, not to say they're unhappy. It's just a sense of uncomfortableness. So knowing that breath works, because I give a lot of, and I'm going to ask you, I got a big ask coming up in about 30 seconds for everybody that's part of this podcast. Knowing that breath works, I give a lot of presentations. Before I present, I take three breaths from my stomach and I just, I just sit with myself each time before I go on stage. Working with you, some personal work we did, I still remember when you were guiding me through a workout, you did what you could to get me out of breath and then you had me just stand up and told me, no, breathe, focus on your breathing, control your breathing and how powerful that was. There's truly power in that. And you talk about tactically at all starting with breath. Is there something you could do for the listeners right now to guide us through a breathing exercise? Like a minute breathing exercise. Now, look, if you're listening to this while you're driving down the road, don't close your eyes and start breathing. I don't need (laughs) that. (laughs) You don't need that. 
But no, no just to, if, could you do something for that for us? And, and I encourage people, if you're driving or anything, to come back to this part and really think about the tactical aspect because this is all where it starts, right? Am absolutely. I wrong in thinking that? No, absolutely. The, the, the interesting thing here is what we're doing by, we're doing is we're you creating an anchor. Right? We're creating a place for our awareness to go. And before I get into it, and, I, and I'm gra- glad you asked me, um, I'm really excited to do this for you. Let's just take it a step away and say, I keep saying modern neuroscience, modern neuroscience, modern neuroscience, right? But why study the brain? What was it that we could have possibly been studying, right? We weren't studying, I mean, there's some pretty morbid stuff out there. I'm sure we're studying the way it looked, right? Probably, hopefully from <laughs> cadavers, right? But like, but what were we studying about? Well, if you're really being honest with yourselves, what we would be studying is, is our attention and where it goes and how and why. And the why here is a big thing, right? Because it took us so long to figure out the why. Right. Why does the default mode network work the way it does? Why does the prefrontal cortex work the way it does? This is all modern stuff. But previous to that, the questions were simple. Why does my awareness go? How do I bring my awareness where I want it to be? Right. And what they figured out in thousands of years ago was if you can use the body in its sensations in a way to bring your awareness to them, it will bring the mind into alignment, right? That's what yoga is. In yoga, I joke all the time, and I, I teach a class called Athlete Stretch. It's, it's not yoga, right? Because I don't want people to misconstrue what yoga is. A yoga is the sensation of the fluctuation of the mind. Interesting topic there, right? So what we're going to do now is yoga, right? We're going to do yoga right now. I'm going to teach you, I'm going to walk you through a, a breathing exercise where you're going to feel the sensation of the fluctuation of the mark and hopefully understand a little deeper and train a little deeper to be able to add something like this to your life. So I guess I'll get started. I think the I'll, I'll try to keep it to about 90 seconds just for the purpose of the, of the podcast. You can extend it as much as you want. But the concepts are simple now. We're going to bring our awareness where we want it to be, all right? And before I get, or you know what, we'll do it first. And then I'll, I'll tell you what I hear from everybody after. I'll give everybody their answer afterwards. So here we go. You ready? So if you could, I would ask you to just sit comfortably somewhere. You can lay down, of course. Close your eyes and bring your awareness to the tip of your nose. Breathing in, pulling in the air that is surrounding your nose and noticing the temperature noticing if there's a smell. When you let the air go back out, see if you can notice the temperature again. So now as you breathe in, follow that air in through the sinuses, down the back of the throat, all the way down into your chest. And just because we have a short period of time, try to follow it all the way down to the belly. Let it all come back out. Now follow it all back down. One, two, three, four. And let it all go back out. You need to find more of those breaths. And if your mind wanders, allow it to come back to this anchor. Breathing in, following the temperature, following the air. Breathing out. Four more. All the way in and all the way out. Three more. Allow yourself to just watch. You're the observer. You're making it happen. Your body's making it happen. Your brain is watching. Last two. All the way in. Fill up. Then let go. And for this last one, just to prove to yourself that you're in control, fill all the way up and hold at the top. Just be full of air. Now look around and see if you can find another sensation in the body. Something that's you feel, whether it's your lungs expanded or a sense of air hunger because you don't like holding your breath this long. And we'll do the opposite end of the spectrum now. Let it all go and just don't breathe back in. We'll stay here for a moment or two and just see if you can relax. And be curious. Allow yourself to look around. Notice something inside the body. Notice that feeling of swallowing because you're uncomfortable. And then when you're ready, go ahead and breathe back in. And you can open your eyes and we'll talk about what just happened from a physical standpoint. And there's no way for me to know what happened in your mind, of course. 
Just like there's no way for me to know what happened in anybody else's mind and for you to know what happened in anybody else's mind. But here we are back to our physical reality. Having just done a short 90 second exercise that connected our brain and our body. So I'll ask you first to identify and sit for a second and think about how you feel, right? And this is where social and emotional learning comes into play. Really just think about how you feel. Don't judge whether your mind wander. If you got to the answer, well, I hated that and that was stupid. Think about why you feel. I call BS, right? Just think about it for a moment. Like, what is it that happened in that, in that time frame? What did you do? Did you bring your, where was your awareness? Was it easy? Was it hard? Was it challenging? Did your mind wander? Did you think about lunch? Right. When I start to do these practices with people and start to help them understand where the very beginning is, I get the same problem, the same opportunity, the same thing every single time. And it's a riot to me because I get the answer like it's the only answer I've ever heard. Well, I can't do that because my brain. Okay. Well, if I'm saying I can't do that because my brain and you say I can't do that because my brain, there must be something to it, right? And that is there's some, there's tons of things to it, right? Number one, we're going into it with the beginner's mind. That's great. But we're saying things to like to ourselves like, Hey, we, we've never done this before. So I'm not going to be good at it. Okay. Well, I would ask you to reframe that and say, you breathe all day, a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> Since the day you were born <laughs> till the day you die. There's something that you do. But the second part and the part that's a little more impactful when it comes to social and emotional learning is the brain and the body do this for you. They don't necessarily want you involved, right? The change in the rhythm, the change in the way the body's doing it because you've taken over, packs the brain and the body, just does. So now, how does it impact the brain and the body? Well. The brain says, all right, I guess Chris has taken over. And the body says, okay, I guess I'll just do whatever he tells me. And then they both go after a little while. All right, I guess we'll just chill out. Let him do what he's supposed to do. And when that chill out happens, that's when we can start to really see what's happening, see what's coming up. It's not about guessing or forcing or making. It's about just seeing, you know? And, And that part is a tough part for people to understand but once you start to get it and it start and you start to be okay with whatever you see, that's where the self acceptance comes in. That's where the self love comes in. That's where the self agency comes in, right? You're just accepting the thing, the things really are. That's what happened today. Today I tried to meditate and I thought about my test the whole time and I didn't even come up with the right answer, right? Okay. That's okay, right? Today I tried to, I tried to spend five minutes with my breath. But I thought about the student that I just can't seem to, to get through to the whole time. Okay. That's what it is. Right. So why? Why did that happen? Well, cause you care. Right. And when we start to feel that way and understand that's what it is, we can start to really be honest with ourselves and look at the actual people making the actual decisions about the actual process. Right. And that's all internal. And that's all what we do. So much to talk about. <laughs> First of all, you know, one, thanks for running that. I've never done that uh, or anything like that on a podcast episode before. So I'm thinking that's got to be beneficial to a lot of the learners and listeners. But just from my own personal perspective, so my mind didn't wander, but I've been I've been doing breathing and things like that. But what I did notice when I opened my eyes again is the room seemed brighter. The colors seemed a different hue, so that's good. And I really like what you talked about, how the self-acceptance piece and how you're interrupting what the body does normally on its own so that it's that very purposeful, mindful piece. So how do we 1% this exercise? Because I'm going to challenge all the listeners to do this again or to spread it with somebody or... Really, if you want the advanced challenge, how do you do this with your class? And leaders, don't hide in the office. How do you do this with your teachers? Because if you want people to do something, you have to do it first. So with that said, go. (laughs) So, you know, I didn't get exposed to this type of, of stuff until I was older. And I can tell you that people that were 
that I was exposed to it from lived by example. And that was really great because I wanted to emulate some of the qualities that I saw in them. Some of the empathy, some of the real deep level of understanding that they clearly showed about themselves. You could tell that they understood themselves. And those were the leaders that would start our meetings with two minutes, right? They would pose a question and allow you to sit and ask the question to yourself and just be okay with whatever came up. Just listen to your body, listen to your mind, anchor yourself in your breath and just allow the body and the brain and the subconscious to just throw up whatever it came up. Now, the secret here is to just be able to look past the surface level, right? And it's really difficult to ask what would came up? I want to know how'd that go? What yeah. happened? Right? <laughs> People are like I don't know. I don't really want to. And whatever came up, right? Yeah. But it's okay. It is okay to do it with the understanding that if you do it consistently, and you do it, I don't know, before every test for three minutes, right? You can explain to them that the outcome they're looking for is a little sense of clarity or a little detachment from the worry and anxiety that they're putting up when they're about to give a presentation, like you used your example, right? What what you're doing there, you're connecting to yourself, you're taking your three breaths, you're, you're responding, not reacting, you're pausing, but you're also taking yourself at least for a short period of time and you're breaking the cycle of anxiety and concern and worry. And once the cycle's broken, don't worry, it'll come back, right? <laughs> But you can do that and you can, you can help people understand the value of it. And when they start to understand the value of it and they start to add it to their own life and start to live by example, it's like that, you know, that thing pushing the rock uphill, right? Eventually you get to that top and it's going to go downhill at a million miles an hour and improve the lives of the people that learned it. That's awesome. One of the things that stood out to me is you talked about honesty and it leading to honesty after breathing. And I think to myself when I hear that, that so much of what we deal with in school as leaders, administrators, teachers, students, has to do with honesty. And that takes a whole lot of bravery to face honesty, or should I say, what the situation actually is. Actually is, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And not just schools, right? Businesses and family units or communities, right? It takes a lot of bravery and it takes a lot of reflection to figure out what is honest, right? Like we talked about earlier. I mean, you can attach yourself to your ethos and your actions may not, may not align with those. But was it an honest mistake? Right? Was your intention right? And you just, you just missed the mark. Right? Once that translates to somebody else, who knows? They're never going to figure it out. Right? They're never going to know if, they, if your intentions were good and you missed the mark. It's just not the way it works. But you can. Right? You can know. You, in putting it off and saying things like the way we both probably grew up, like just, it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's all right. It's all right. Do back. It's fine. Right? Okay. So now we know that we had an honest mistake. Right. Because we're okay with the fact that it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But okay, so now what caused the honest mistake? What was it? What was the deep thing? What was the reason I didn't say that one thing I was going to say when I thought I should, but maybe I didn't? And then it all unraveled. What was the reason? Right. And we won't, we're not trying to answer those questions when we're sitting with our breath. We're trying to allow ourselves to just see what comes up. And it's such an interesting and powerful thing because. What comes up will be the truth. You call it the subconscious mind. You call, you know, they've written books upon books upon books about the subconscious mind. But what comes up will be, will help you guide you in the future. So here's the thing, because we're getting to the end. Digging deeper, the actual issue at hand for an honest assessment of whether it's BS or whether it's what we're actually looking at is not about getting answers. It's about taking control of our mind and creating the space so that answers can come to us. Is that what I'm, is that what I'm hearing? Is that right? The only 
words I would challenge you with was the words taking control. Okay. It's not going to work. <laughs> Come on, man. You're taking away, taking control? Uh, yeah, on. it isn't. I mean, we say, we joke, we have control of our emotions. We have control of our self-agency, right? Taking control of our mind is just not a thing we have the capability of doing. But everything you said is correct. I would just caution or say, maybe just do the exercise just to do the exercise. And allow is a better word. Allow yourself Allow your mind to be what your mind is and allow yourself to notice what the mind is. And as that starts to evolve and you start to to notice and without judgment, become okay with it, right? That's your mindfulness practice at its core. That's when the truth comes. That's when the seeing comes to use your... (laughs) Yeah, there you go. I appreciate that. That's when it all... I love the book impacted me in a, in a tremendous way. What, I hope we can get into that when, whenever we're done talking about the powerful communities because it, it impacted me in a tremendous way. But yeah, just think about, from the listeners out there, think about, do the exercise, connect to your breath, allow, allow your brain to be what it is. Allow yourself to notice. If you really want to get trippy and figure it out, question, how can I possibly be noticing what, what, what I'm noticing? Who's the noticing? Who's the noticer here, right? And there's a book, plenty of other books written on that too. Yeah, yeah. But, right, that's when we start into the Kaizen principles of 1% every, 1% better every day. What's actually going on in between my two ears? When I'm thinking about when there's no one around and I'm just sitting thinking, what am I actually thinking about? Is it the future? Is it the past? Is it a conversation I wish I could have done better on? Is it a work issue? Is it a family concern, right? The more you notice, the more you allow, the more you can see clearly, and the more you can really start to get better 1% every day. That's awesome. And the idea of honesty and actually... And 1% better is incredibly powerful. And the realization of those, I would say, is incredibly powerful, which is why I'm excited to talk about on the next episode, powerful and developing. I think, I think that's going to be really good. I, you know, Mike, you, and I said this from the start that you've got so much to offer, but I've got, I've got two challenges for the podcast listeners. The first challenge comes from episode one, and I love that now there seems to be a challenge with every episode, the gratitude jar. Do the gratitude jar. The second challenge is do this breathing exercise. And if you already did it with you leading it, Mike, that's excellent. But now try it again on your own. One thing I would ask is if you can do this, Mike, what's the next step? I'm a leader. I've decided that I want to try this breathing exercise again. And I'm going to try it in the middle of my day. I'm going to shut my office door. I'm going to shut my classroom door for my prep period where I have some time. And I'm going to do this breathing exercise. I do this breathing exercise maybe five days in a row, maybe twice each day, five days in a row, because it's working for me. Can't quite explain why it's working for me or how, but I know it's working. I feel more at ease. I feel like I'm clearer after it. Is there a next step? Is there a 1% better to take it to the next level? that's attainable by somebody. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely there is. So often we are reluctant to take this next step, but it's very valuable. When you are done with your breathing exercise, write down something. Take, if you want to take, if you want it to be six minutes, take four minutes of breathing, set your clock for four minutes, open your eyes, look around the room, and take two full minutes, then use your timer and write. And if it's, if it's sentences, great. If it's thoughts, great. If it's words, great. If it's a drawing, fine. And just keep it. You don't have to go back and look at it. But what I would challenge you with is if you do it for a week, two weeks, and then go back and look at day one and see what you wrote and see if the thoughts were the same or if the feelings were the same. Or the words that you put on the paper, what is it? Right. If they aren't, I would absolutely consider that growth. I would absolutely consider that 1% better. Right. And if it's worse things you wrote on the page today, I'm, but I have to, I have to do detention duty or 
but whatever the case may be, if they were even not as good, and there's no good and bad here. It's just a question of noticing the difference and noticing who you really are and what's going on. And really noticing if you do feel better after the six minutes. And I, I have a sneaking suspicion that you will. Thank you very much for that. And to bring it around as a just a peek at the next episode, how powerful would that be for a classroom to have students do that at the beginning of each class for a week straight and then to look back? I think the work is exponential. There you go. Well, awesome. Maybe we'll talk about that more in the next episode, which I can't plug enough as we go through this series. You know, Mike, you've got so much to say. We've got challenges. You did a meditation. You did like a breathing exercise. Can we call it a meditation? Yeah, absolutely. For people live on the podcast. So this is a fantastic series. I can't encourage people enough. If you haven't listened to the first one, you got to go back and listen to the first one. If you've, if you did, then I look forward to talking with Mike again for the third one and having you along for the ride. So Mike, once again, as we wrap this up, thank you very much for being on the Scene Elite podcast and offering all these tools and um, this wisdom and knowledge to the listeners. Thank you for having me. And I'm excited to talk about power next, the next time. Well, that's a wrap, but not the end. Next step, be sure to take action on something you have heard here today. Hey, thanks for listening to the Scene to Lead podcast. If you would like to connect for any reason, email me at drchrissj at gmail.com or catch me on Twitter at Dr. C.S. Jones. If you've gotten any value from the Scene to Lead podcast today, you can help me and other leaders create a world-class environment through a teacher-centric approach by subscribing to the show, leaving an honest rating or review, and sharing this episode on social media with your most valuable takeaway. Also, one last thing. Have you had a chance to pick up my latest five-star rated book yet? Grab your copy of Seeing to Lead anywhere you buy books or at seeingtolead.com. That's S-E-E-I-N-G-T-O-L-E-A-D.com where you can learn more and continue to improve. Now go have a successful week.